Okay, so last week we began looking at the section where Paul is, for uh, lack of a better term, he's actually giving us what is the pre-gospel. He's giving us the background as to why it is that the gospel is needed. Uh, why it is that um, the righteousness that we need to have to be in a personal relationship with the Holy God is a righteousness that only can come from God himself. It's not a righteousness that we can develop on our own. And why uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ has to be received by faith. There's no other way um, that we might obtain it. And so his argument last week, we said was primarily directed toward Gentiles, not exclusively, but it was primarily directed to Gentiles because he was focusing on God's revelation in his creation, what we call natural revelation. That is that we can look around in the world that God has created and we can see certain things about God. Not everything there is to know about God, but we can see his divine nature. We can see his power. We can see his justice. And in seeing that, we um, should know that he is to be worshipped and he is to be thanked for his goodness, his benevolence to us. And when one does not do that, uh, then one is subject to God's wrath. And we saw the outcome of that as uh, Paul worked through the downward spiral of, of people rejecting God and choosing to worship his creation rather than him. And then being um, God removing his restraint upon people and and we see them going deeper and deeper into um, the sinfulness that comes from a darkened heart and a and a um, depraved mind so as we begin this morning um, Paul takes uh, Paul is going to um, now approach primarily a different audience I'm going to argue that really he he has the Jewish people in mind, particularly in chapter two. Not that they weren't a part of chapter one, uh, but when we think of natural revelation, we don't normally think of the Jews because they had supernatural revelation. They had the word of God. Um, and uh, what Paul does in, in developing this is he, he picks a, I guess we can say a fictitious person, but a typical person. Um, that is one who, um, who he knows would hold a particular position, and um, I'm going to argue that it is the Jewish position, and then he has this dialogue with that person in order to bring out uh, the truth that he wants to uh, develop, and we see Paul doing that uh, a couple of times in the book of Romans, and he has done it in some of his other letters as well. It's a very uh, interesting technique to, to put across your point. Um, but if we look at verse 1, we see what Paul says. He says, therefore, you have no excuse, O man or O person, uh, every one of you who judges. So Paul has picked out this person who would agree with him as to what he said in the verses that we looked at last week. That person has no problem with seeing God condemn all these sinners out there. But the person doesn't believe that he or she is one of those people. Mm -hmm. And so Paul then is developing this argument with this person to show that that's not a valid position to hold. Now, it's true that Paul only mentions the Jews in verse 17, uh, but the argument in the previous verses, particularly 6 through 16, doesn't make any sense if verses 1 through 5 isn't primarily directed towards the Jews. Um, it's for everybody. So I don't want you to think this doesn't apply to us. It does. In fact, it applies to a great many non-Jews because we hold the same attitude that they held. But particularly here, Paul wants to show that the Jews are not exempt from what he has said um, in, in the previous verses. Uh, they don't get a get out of jail free card. <laughs> and that was pretty much their attitude at the time <clears throat> so the therefore uh really relates back to verses 19 through 32 where again the primary focus was on gentiles but um, certainly jews uh, were included in that and again the jews felt uh were 
would not have disagreed with Paul's statement about God's wrath being poured out on sinners. They just didn't feel that they were included <laughs> in that in that wrath. And the reason is, and I just listed um, there in bullet form what the Jews actually believed. And the key really is their covenantal relationship through Abraham. Um, they knew that they were God's chosen people. They knew that they were in a covenant um, as Abraham's children. And they expected, therefore, that God would accept them because of that covenant, irrespective of how they lived. Um, the second part, the Jews expected salvation if they maintain connection with Abraham by observance of the law and right of circumcision. By observance of the law, I mean the uh, ceremonial law. Uh, in fact, if you look at the Old Testament, you can see that there's many, many places where the prophets condemn the Jewish people because they come and they offer the sacrifices required by God, and then they go out and live any old way they want to, and they live wickedly all week long, and they come back and do sacrifices. So they felt that if they kept the ceremonial law, if they kept the rite of circumcision, and sometimes they didn't even do that, but most of the time they were faithful in those things, but they didn't live in a way that pleased the Lord. Yes. That wouldn't be un, that wouldn't be in error for an Old Testament Jew because that's really how God did deal. God did not forgive. Well, he, he did, but um, like the sacrifice in the Holy of Holies was for the nation, mm -hmm. not for individuals. When God judged um, you know, he didn't send the Philistines to an individual. He would, uh, he would judge the entire nation of Israel. So there, there was reason for them to have this belief. It wasn't to a point. To yes. a point. Yes. To, to a, point. a point. You're right. Um, um, but there are instances of well, individuals. Being but judged. also, yeah. you remember, there's a number of places in the Old Testament where God said. What I really wanted when you were circumcised is not outward circumcision, okay. circumcision of the heart. I want a heart that's committed to me, not okay. just not just doing outward ritual. And uh, and the Jews at the time of Christ particularly did not see salvation as individual. They still saw it as community. Correct. And and I think that's where the problem is because Jesus says, you know, you're living like pagans. Well, we're Abraham's children. <laughs> you know, we're part of the covenant. You know, we're covered, and um, and that's not the case. And Paul is trying to show, particularly here, um, that those things are not uh, the things that decide salvation for us. And we might apply it to ourselves by saying, um, in fact, this is really interesting. Um, first church we came to when we were in uh, uh, the Seattle area was a church that had a gymnasium, and so. Uh, a friend of mine and I put on a basketball ministry for the boys in the, in the community. And one, e one evening after basketball, we were talking with them and I, I asked them the question, how many of you think that you think that you're Christians? And I was actually surprised to see a number of hands go up. And, and so I said, well, tell me why you think you're a Christian. And of course I got the, <laughs> um, you know, my, my parents are Christians. Um, um, I, uh, I've been to church. I was baptized as a child. Um, and even a couple kids said, um, I live in America. Oh, wow. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> but they were relying on things other than faith in Christ to make that decision. And there are a lot of people who attend church who are relying on membership at NKBC or the fact that they've been baptized, or the fact that they take communion, uh, or the fact that they attend church at all, uh, or other things. And this is what Paul is saying. These things, apart from faith in Jesus Christ, don't save anybody. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, we're going to see that, that all they do is really condemn you. Um, and that's important, because again, Paul's whole argument is, we're all sinners, and therefore, we need a savior. There's no way anybody's getting out of this apart from Christ. And um, and his, and the Jews are his biggest problem at this point because um, they really don't believe um, that uh, that that God is not going to exempt them uh, from the situation that uh, that 
presents itself in, in, the, in the earlier part of this letter. So Paul goes on to say, um, well, let me just read one and two together. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. So what Paul is saying is the ground or the basis of condemnation is the thing that's done. And if you condemn someone else for doing it, you've automatically condemned yourself if you do the same thing. So if I, if I condemn John for lying, and then I turn around and lie, I have condemned myself because I already condemned him for that very same practice. And in truth, that's what the Jews in many respects were doing. If we looked at that list that we looked at last week, I just picked out a few here, pride, arrogance, gossiping, maligning, um, lack of affection, all of those things were characteristic of Jews as much as they were of Gentiles. Um, in fact, we can go back into the Old Testament and see worse uh, among the Jewish people. So they weren't exempt from those things. They would condemn a Gentile or a Greek from doing those things, but, but they would excuse themselves. And uh, so principle number one, and I <clears throat> listed these as principles because there's really uh, five principles, I think, in this section we're going to look at four this morning and one next week, where Paul talks about how does God judge people apart from Christ? And I think that's important because a lot of Christians today believe that the only, that we're only judged if we reject Jesus, and it's the rejection of Jesus that condemns us. And it's not. Paul says you're already condemned because of what you do. God judges based on works and if you're if you don't have good works if you're a sinner then you're subject to judgment apart from the gospel and that's his argument here it's all about works so the first principle is he who condemns in others what he does himself does thereby condemn himself and we've all done that i think we are all, we're all guilty not just jews i think we're all guilty of having judged somebody uh, in some way that we look back later and go, wow, I do the same thing. <laughs> I do that, you know, but I've condemned you for doing it. It's almost a principle <clears throat> that if you come up against a, a judgmental person, the thing they're the most judgmental about <laughs> will be the sin that they tend to fall into the most. Yeah, isn't that? Yeah. You don't, want, you don't want to be able to see it in other people, but we right. don't want to see it in ourselves. And, and it's a it's a really good way to judge yourself is what are you most critical about? That's <laughs> probably what you're dealing with at this time. That's a good point, Larry. That's a good point. Okay, verse, verse two. You know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who do such things. We know. Um Again, he's affirming that God's judgment is against sin, and it's fully in accord with, I guess we could say, the facts or the circumstances. Um, and he says, we know, that is, he believes that this person he's in dialogue with agrees with him that, in fact, God judges rightly according to the situation. He's, he's not a, a, uh, an unrighteous judge. He doesn't judge uh, falsely. Um, his dialogue partner is going to agree with that. What he's not going to agree with is he should be included in the decision. Um, so the second principle then is really God's judgment are according to the truth or the real state of the case. Um, God's judgment is certain. We're going to see that. Um, Paul's assuming it right here, but he'll actually state it twice later. And God's judgment is without error and without respect of persons. That is where the Jew does not agree. Um, that they believe that God does make exceptions and they're the exception. <clears throat> and really what the Jew wanted was, if God's going to judge according to the truth, then part of that truth is the special relationship that we have with him as his chosen people. And Paul doesn't deny that. In fact, he even states that's important. Um, you don't want, uh, he does not want to, um, to minimize the blessing that the Jewish people have had as a part of that relationship with God. It's very significant, and he spends a great deal of time both in chapter 3 and later on in chapter 9 talking about that relationship. But that relationship doesn't excuse their sinfulness before God. 
they still need to have that dealt with. And, um, and that's his argument. Um, in fact, verse three really focuses on that point. Do you suppose, O oh man or O oh person, you who judge those who do such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? That is, do you really think that the things that you condemn others for and then you do, do you really think God's going to turn his turn turn uh, turn his eyes away from you and say, oh, that's okay. I'm going to punish these people for doing that, but I won't punish you. Do you really think that's really what God's going to do? Um, it, it's, it's a foolish argument for me to argue, well, you guys are all guilty of it, but God's not going to judge me for that. You know, if he's going to judge you, he's going to judge me. And that's what Paul is saying. It's, it's foolish to think that God, who is impartial and no respecter of persons, is going to make exceptions just simply because of some blessing that he has given us in the past. So first of all, he challenges that belief. But then he says, really, what you're doing is even more serious than that. Verse 4 or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So here, Paul uses three terms tied in with riches to describe what we would call God's mercy or God's goodness. I, I, you see a number of different words in the translation i think goodness is probably the the broadest term uh, when we think of god's goodness we think of his love we think of his mercy we think of his grace we think of his kindness all of those all of those ideas are um, are subsumed under goodness um, and so depending upon your translations mine says kindness again this word is, con is consistently used in scripture to designate God's goodness toward his people. The opposite would be severity. So if we don't have severity, we have God's goodness, God's um, graciousness. And then his forbearance and patience. This is a picture of God withholding the judgment that is rightly due a sinner um, for a particular purpose. I remember R.C. Sproul saying once that... Uh, you know, God had every right when Adam and Eve sinned in what he called cosmic rebellion against God to just obliterate the human race and be done with them. But what does God do? God clothes Adam and Eve. Um, he hides their guilt in, uh, by, by sacrificing an animal and clothing them. And then he promises that he will deal permanently with their sin um, one day when the seed of the woman will, will produce an offspring who will defeat Satan and, and satisfy God's wrath. So God doesn't destroy. God is patient uh, with people. And that's what Paul is saying is that God is immensely patient. Um, rather than, Now, he does judge some, and he does some, judge some immediately. And, and Paul has said that at the very beginning. God's wrath is even now being poured out on, on wicked sinners. But oftentimes, God withholds his judgment for now. But we can take that lightly. We can, uh, we, can, um, we can be presumptive about that patience, that forbearance, and we can treat it as a license to sin. Oh, God isn't punishing, so... I'm just going to go ahead and do what I want to do. Or we can come up with the idea, as many um, people do, well, God is so patient. He's always going to be patient. He's never going to judge. He's, he's always going to be that way towards people. He's such a loving God. He would never think of, of condemning anyone. Um, and so, I mean, I, I've, I don't know how many people I've talked to on airplanes. One was a very interesting conversation because I was reading J.I. Packard's book, Knowing God, and, and uh, her comment to me after I told her what the book was, so she said, um, I believe that God is love. And I said, well, he is, but he's also a holy God and a just God. <laughs> and, uh, and because of that, he has to punish sin. And it was like, what? <laughs> wow. So it was interesting. She finally did uh, allow me to, to send her a copy of the book and I never did hear whether she changed her view 
but it's a very common view that God is loving and that's all he is. And so if that were really true, then yes, God would never punish sin. What would be, why would he do that? But there's more to God than just love. And Paul is saying, you know, God's wrath is his determination because of his holiness to punish the sinner. And so, um, and so it's presumptuous for us to think that he won't do it. Even Christians fall into that trap of yeah. thinking, well, I have eternal life, therefore God isn't judging my sin. The reality is, you know, God judged our sin through Christ. Yes. It, it's not that he didn't judge our sin. He had to judge everybody's sin fairly. It's just Christ took the punishment. For Absolutely. It. And I think that's the difference between the pious Christian and the lascivious Christian is that, you know, do you believe God punishes sin or not? You know, if every sin I commit, it, it, if I truly see that as an offense against the death of Christ, it really changes your your perspective of, of how do I need to live my life in order to please God. Excellent. Yes, absolutely. And I think Paul is trying to help us to see that. Um, here he's really focused on, on the person who, who thinks that God is never going to judge, but, but we get careless. And I think that's what Larry's saying. We get very careless about how we live. Well, it's covered by the blood of Christ. So yeah, I'll just go I'm on. Disrespectful. And, yeah. yeah. And, 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 it, and it clearly shows contempt yeah. for the cross. I've, um, I've had kind of a revelation this morning. Okay. Because there's a piece of the argument is missing in the book of Romans. And I, I had never noticed it. Missing? So are, are you accusing Paul? <laughs> no, because he, he addresses it somewhere else. Okay. So it's addressed to the Jews who are relying on their special relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's focused on. I had never caught that. The piece that's missing is the fact that uh, we don't need priests. Priests are obsolete. No more sacrifice. You can't go out and sin all week and then offer a sacrifice and everything's better. And that whole idea is, is torn apart in every verse just about in the book of Hebrews. Right. Mm -hmm. Hebrews attacks, you can't just go out, sin all the time, and then have a priest, just make everything better. Okay, that's all about your heart, but I hadn't caught it. This book is focusing on, don't, don't think you're okay just because you think you have a special relationship. Mm -hmm. And the book of Hebrews is all about, by the way, you can't just make sacrifices and mm -hmm. make everything better. Like two separate books. And it's very it's easy to, yeah, yeah, you guys are right. It's very easy to fall into that trap. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, what Paul says next is, is, is really on point. He says, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. So when we treat these things lightly and contemptuously, we're basically saying that we don't understand or don't care to understand that God's whole purpose in this is to draw us back to himself in forsaking sin and repenting of sin and, and, and being in a right relationship. We, we tend to want to think, well, he's not going to ever do anything, so I'll just do what I want. But the very opposite is true. God is calling us um, back to himself, and to what Larry was talking about, a righteous life before him. And, um, and so... It leads us to repentance, really, as, as I think as Larry said, because, because it shows us the duty um, that we have to the one who, um, who has, even if we leave Christ out for a minute, the one who has loved us and who has cared for us, you know, our whole life, we have this incredible God. But then when we realize what Christ has done for us, um, and it gives us a ground for hope that we will be accepted because we have turned from our sin and we are seeking <clears throat> to serve the Lord. But if we don't do that, Paul says, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, verse 5, you are storing up wrath for yourselves on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So here he's saying clearly, there's going to be a time of judgment. Uh, it's coming. And instead of mercy, it's going to be wrath for the person who presumes on God's kindness um, and, and treats it with contempt. Um, and it comes out of a hardened and impenitent heart. That is, when we presume upon God, when we think that when God is patient and forbearing before us, um, and we presume that he'll do nothing or that he doesn't care how we live, um, it comes from a hard heart. It comes from a heart that really is rejecting the grace of God and using that grace of God to sin more rather than to turn away from sin. 
And Paul says, when we do that, we're storing up wrath. And I've always used this illustration. The first house we ever lived in when we moved to Seattle was a tiny one bedroom home. Uh, it had a, it was a two bedroom and they had converted it to a one bedroom, make the bedroom a little larger. And it had two tiny walk-in closets on the side. One was for clothes and one we, it was the only storage we had in the whole house was in the other closet. And so we kept putting stuff in that room and it kept getting more mm -hmm. crowded. And I've always pictured of us storing stuff up. Now we were not storing them up for the wrath of God, but we were storing mm -hmm. stuff up to the point where you were afraid to open the door. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was going to fall down and, and, and on your head because there was so much stuff in that little bitty closet. But that's the picture. As we reject God's grace and presume upon it, we are storing up that wrath, not necessarily for right now, but certainly for the day of judgment when that wrath uh, will come about into each one of us. And that's what he was talking. Little by little, we store it up until one day uh, the judgment comes. And he says, on the day of wrath, again, this is the picture of the final judgment, uh, the judgment that comes at the end of time. And he says very clearly, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed, that is God's judgment that is completely righteous, that it's completely just, that it's completely fair, it will be revealed because it's going to apply to everybody, and it will be based, again, on truth. So our third principle, then, is the special goodness of God, which is shown or manifested toward individuals or people as a whole, do not form, uh, forms no ground or no basis of exemption from the punishment that we deserve. That's what the Jew thought. Uh, but being designed to lead us to repentance, when we ignore it, it just aggravates our condemnation. So Paul is pretty hard here, but I think he has to be. Um, not only do Jews hold this view, but you've all agreed that many, many people think we don't have to worry. You know, we're, we're, we're good to go here. And Paul's point in this whole thing is to show that we're all in the same position uh, according um, to our, because of our sinfulness, we all are guilty before God and we all need a savior. <clears throat> so in the next verses, he's going to elaborate on this. I think he's made his point, but now he, he wants to go back and, and show how it is that God judges. And he's made it clear that it is according to works, but verse six um, if there was any doubt <laughs> that that's what we're talking about, verse 6 says that he, that is God, will render to each one according to his works. God's going to judge impartially, but he's going to judge according to the same standard, and that standard is works. It's what we've done in our life, good or bad. Now, the next verse <laughs> is one of those verses in, in Romans that can cause a lot of problems if, if we don't understand what Paul is saying. And it's been interesting, if you look at the history of interpretation, it seems clear that a lot of people haven't understood what Paul is saying because there's just any number of interpretations that really don't fit. Um, so I'm going to try to give you two that do, and I'm going to try to argue for one that I think is better than the other. But the phrase is, to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. So what he's doing is he's laying out two possible outcomes of God rendering his judgment according to works. One is eternal life and the other is condemnation. And those are the only two possibilities there are. You're either going to be in heaven with God or you're going to be condemned eternally. There's no middle ground. Um, there is an afterlife. You're not going to be annihilated, as people say today. That's not going to happen. Um, you're going to live eternally, but you're going to live either in the presence of God or under his condemnation. But he does say, if you are patient in doing in, in well-doing, that is, if you consistently do well-doing, it's not just that you do it once in a while, but you've done it your whole life, then there is the, then there is the reward of eternal life. This has caused, you can see why this would cause a problem. 
particularly because what Paul says in Romans 3.20 is that no one will be justified by the works of the law. And here it seems that he says that you can be. So the question then becomes, who are these people that um, this promise is made to? And like I said, there's a number of views, but I think there's only two that, um, that uh, deserve merit. So I, I've listed the two in your notes and let's go through them. Um, the first one is that what, God, what Paul is actually referring to here is Christians. As, as they and they only are the ones who through a union with Christ are able to produce works um, that are acceptable to God in the judgment. <clears throat> that is on the surface, I think a legitimate understanding. I think there's some problems with it. Um, the first problem that I see with it is that when, when we talk about the works of believers, those works are only done in union with Jesus Christ through faith. And those works are never seen as a justification for us um, as, as a... Um, as a means of, of, of being justified by God. We are justified by our faith in the work of Christ. Works, good works, which proceed from that justification are proof of our being justified, but they are not the basis for our being justified. They do not count um, toward our justification in the final judgment. Those works will be judged. But you remember Paul says elsewhere, those works will be judged. And if they're not, if they're not lived according to God's grace and according to his word, they're going to be burnt up. But the foundation that's in Christ will remain. So there is a judgment of our works, but our works are never the basis for our right standing before God, even as Christians, because they're always imperfect. All of our works are imperfect. Even as believers today, we, we, our works are not perfect. Um, but the work of Christ is. And so uh, I think for that alone uh, is probably not the best trans, uh, best uh, interpretation. But more to the point, if we go back to verse 6, what does he say? God's judgment is according to works. It seems then inconsistent that all of a sudden he brings in grace and faith <laughs> to talk about believers um, at this point. His focus has been and continues to be um, his argument is there's universal sin, everybody's a sinner, and sin is so pervasive and so powerful that no one can be right before God as sinners, and therefore everybody needs Christ. That's his argument. So again, to bring in the gospel at this point really destroys the argument. We're not at the gospel yet. In fact, we don't get to the gospel until chapter four. Um, and I think we, if we can see that, we can see why, why Paul, what Paul is doing in a different light. Um, I think to see this as a picture of Christians destroys the argument, or at least interrupts the argument, and doesn't help it when Paul is talking about works, our works. Um, so the other view, which I think is, is probably better, is that this is a promise of eternal life for those who do good works. The problem is the power of sin prevents us from doing that. Just like Paul says um, later on in Romans chapter 7, the law, there's nothing wrong with the law of God. The problem is us. It's our sinfulness that keeps us from obeying the law. It's, it's the argument, the law does not save you your good works would save you if you could keep the law. Yes. The problem is you can't. Yes. I, I think that's the argument. Okay. Yeah. It's there, and God would be unjust if you, Larry, perfectly kept the law to condemn you. Mm -hmm. But you don't perfectly mm -hmm. keep the law. And it's so what, it's what caused Christ to meet the criteria. Exactly. He's the one that did. He's the one that did. And I think we forget that sometimes, that our righteousness, which is given to us by God, is the righteousness of Christ 
who kept the law perfectly for us. We can't do it. He did. It's his righteousness that we receive. It's still law. It's still perfection of keeping the law, but it's his doing, not ours. Um, and just a slight thing is when they talk about the judgment, whether it's the judgment of sinners or the judgment of the righteous, both judgments are works. Yes. But neither one determines eternal life or eternal death. That's already decided. Yes. The judgment of works is what are the consequences of those works. If you're Christian, the consequence is either it, it it's worthy and you get the rewards. And uh, it seems to me that, you know, in the lake of fire, you know, what you did on this earth will determine what happens for eternity in the lake of fire. Um, so mm -hmm. you will be judged for your works regardless. It's, it's just that doesn't determine where you're going. Yes. It determines what happens once you're there. Um, it, but that, that's one of those things. I'm under Christ. Uh, I'm not going to be judged. Yes, you are. Yeah, we are going to be judged. Yeah. And we need to see that. It, it, uh, and Paul's very clear here for that reason. There is a judgment and that judgment is works. Um, apart from the gospel, that is <laughs> what people will be judged by. And we need to understand that. Um, so again here, I think he is saying, uh, particularly to the Jew now, is that everybody's going to be judged on the same basis. And it's works. It's not on covenantal relationship alone. It's not on national identity. It's not on some right that you've done, like um, got baptized or observed the Lord's Supper or um, been circumcised if you're a Jew or any of those things. Those things are in and of themselves may be good and right and helpful, but they are not going to determine where you spend eternity. And that's the point that they needed to see. And that's why he says to the Jew first and also the Greek. He says that twice. And I think what he's saying to the Jew is that, look, you were the first <laughs> to have the blessings of God. And you're going to be the first to suffer the punishment of God if you don't turn from your sin and turn to Christ. Um, so verses 7 and repeated in verse 10, because he repeats himself now in verses um, 9 and 10. Um, they set out the conditions apart from Christ for salvation. And then, as Larry said, Paul's subsequent argument is, but none of you keep those requirements. <laughs> so you're all under condemnation. But if somebody could do it and did do it, they would be given eternal life. What's the other side? Again, as we said, there's only two. And so Paul says in verse 8, but for those who are self-seeking, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. So again, only two fates, it's eternal life or it's eternal condemnation. And then Romans 3 seals their fate. There is none righteous. There is none righteous. No, no not one. And that's where Paul's going. You know, I mean, we we who know Romans 3 know, is, know he's going to get there. <laughs> this is a legal argument. It is. He's setting up all the evidence with that verse none yeah none yeah. of you meet these criteria you're guilty and it's a powerful argument it really is when you see it laid out the way paul lays it out it's 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 a powerful argument you can't argue with it at all um and that's the point this so-called person he's dialoguing with is <laughs> he thinks he's got it all set up so, yeah. yeah you're right yeah you're right i'm good i'm good i'm good whoa none righteous wait a minute <laughs> And I think that, you know, that I, I see that as the way Paul often argued with people. He would set them up by agreeing with them or getting them to agree with him to a point. And then once he'd gotten them there, he nailed them, yeah. you know. But here's the, here's the thing you didn't consider. And, and I think that's a beautiful way to argue it, but it helps us to see there really aren't any of these excuses that we keep bringing in for, for our relationship really only depends on this or this or this. It depends on Christ because there really isn't any other position to hold um so when we look at this then what does he say about these people he says the other group of people they're selfish they're self-seeking they're selfish people well we can be selfish too um so we have to realize that you know we can be like that as well so from their motivation they're selfish and from the standpoint of their allegiance 
Paul says they give themselves in obedience to unrighteousness rather than truth. So if you're going to give yourself to the one thing that to to um, to uh, seeking um, immortality and, and holiness and righteousness, God will give you eternal life. But if you're going to do these other things, you're going to end up with God's wrath and with his fury. And then in verse nine, he reverses that. So you can, it's just almost the exact opposite with slight variation. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jews first and also the Greek. So here, tribulation Normally, we would use tribulation to describe the trials and the sufferings of Christians in this life. But the context here, I think, tribulation is related to wrath at the end. So the tribulation is the judgment and the tribulation that comes from God's condemnation of those who continue to live like this. And distress is related, very closely related to it. It might possibly be focused on more of a subjective suffering but the two words are very closely related and again relate to um, God's end time judgment. And notice he says, every human being who does evil, everyone mm -hmm. without exception, there's no way of getting around it by pleading for some kind of a, of a relationship apart from Christ. And again, the Jew first, uh, the promise came to the Jew, Paul loves the Jews, but he's clear if you don't see your need for a savior, um, then you will be the first to be judged. And then finally, um, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. So this is really um, pretty much the same as, um, as verse seven. Um, the order again, like I said, is reverse. Um, and glory and honor before they were things that were pursued by the righteous person here they're the blessings that God gives as part of his salvation he gives glory he gives honor he gives peace and again I think we all know that the peace that scripture uses this is a comprehensive word it it, it, it it's we, we can call it perfect well-being I guess it, it, yeah it's the shalom it's the it's not just it's not just that we're not at war, but but everything about us is in harmony as it should be. It's it's what we were intended to be before sin entered our lives. Um, it's it's a perfect relationship with with God. It's a perfect relationship with each other. It's a perfect relationship with ourselves. Uh, it's the place where uh, where we were intended to be, and God gives that um, that peace that defies understanding through. Our relationship with Christ. Uh, here he says it's for those who keep <laughs> the commandments, but we know that no one can do that, so we have to get our peace through our Savior. And then finally, Paul ends it um, rather emphatically, for God shows no partiality, mm -hmm. no favoritism, um, no looking the other way on certain people. Um, it's all based on conduct. That's what he's going to judge. And we're all guilty. So that fourth principle then um, that I find in verses 6 through 11 is this. The ground of judgment or the basis of our judgment is works. Not the external relations or professions of men. And by professions, I don't mean profession of faith in Christ. I mean things that we say, um, things that we claim to have relationship to or claim to have done. Um, that somehow exempts us from this concept of works. Um, because obviously your profession of faith in Christ, if it's genuine, does make a huge difference. God will punish the wicked, reward the good, Jew or Gentile, without the least respect of persons. Hmm. Now what Paul's going to do next time is continue this argument, develop it a little further, and then, as you know, he's going to move into chapter three. The beginning of chapter three, he gives us quote after quote from the Old Testament to show this is the way God's always been. This is this is God's standard. There's no one righteous, no one who does good, no one who loves God. Um, the whole of, of human society is this way. And so we need a savior. We need we need a we need a righteousness that is outside of us, that is foreign to us, because we don't have a righteousness 
um, that will give us allow us to have a right relationship with God. Um, and again, uh, you, can you see why Paul is moving in this direction? Because if we can't establish this, we, we, we can't establish a need for the gospel. Mm -hmm. If people won't see that they aren't righteous in and of themselves, or if they don't see that God doesn't judge on a curve, <laughs> you know, well, I'm 60% maybe, <laughs> and, you know, you know, if all the rest of you are worse than 60%, maybe we're okay. Um, but what, what Jesus says and what Paul says is be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Mm -hmm. And James says that we, if we stumble at just one thing, we're guilty of everything. So we really don't have a, 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 a God who judges on a curve. And, um, and we know that we can't keep the law perfectly. And so we really stand before God condemned apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's really where Paul wants us to be. So, you know, as we read this, as we, as we, we think about it, as we realize that, that should, uh, I think as Larry said, that should just increase our love for, for God and for Christ when we realize that when we were helpless, this is what God did for us in Jesus. Um, and it's an amazing thing uh, because really we stand before him otherwise with no hope at all.